partly in this graph, which is that, uh, I still have the Argentina graph, I'm sorry. Um, firms don't know what they don't know. Now, we're supposedly, I'm almost done. Um, we're supposedly uh, are honest with ourselves about our capabilities, but in fact, we're human, and we tend to think we're a lot better than we are. And what also turns out to be is, if you look in the x-axis here, on the bottom, that's the actual quality, your objective management quality. On the vertical axis is your self-perceived managerial quality. And what you notice is there's almost no correlation, right? In fact, there is no correlation, except that the worse you are, objectively speaking, the better you tend to think you are. The only country that is an exception to this are the Singaporeans who think, yeah, actually, we're not as good as we are. Something about that country that is quite remarkable. Um, but if you have a bunch of people in Latin America, you see Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, all these mucky mucks that I was talking to, really high level guys who think they're awesome. And then when you go and say, look, I, I benchmarked you against the US and you know, the UK and Japan, and you got a lot of room to grow here. And they say, no. Um, well, how are they ever going to pay money to upgrade? They're not going to. Um, so I think there's a huge information asymmetry, um, which uh, is part of the reason we see these programs around the world and that they're heavily subsidized in Japan, the US, and elsewhere. It's exactly because you have to help firms see that mm, they're not very good to start with. Um, and then you help them, uh, you know, it's a two-step, four-step process, whatever. You acknowledge you have a problem and then fix it. Um, so that, you know, this kind of building of managerial firm uh, technological capital over time, I think is as much of an explanation for the Asian miracles that we've studied in the past, that you know, over the last half century, um, as a lot of other as a lot of other things, and so we need to work on this regulatory environment for the reasons I was talking about. Um, I've tried to highlight throughout, but we also have to worry on this managerial ca uh, capital uh, angle as well. I just want to end with a quote from Prostor: "Fortune favors the prepared mind." We don't know what Industry 4.0 is going to bring for the Philippines in terms of opportunities or in terms of challenging industries that already exist that are going to have to, to adapt. We don't know. We don't know what climate change is going to do to Philippine agriculture or whatever. We don't know. What we do know, though, is we have to have the innovative cap capacity. And again, I'm not talking digital stuff. I'm just talking we have to have the capability to say, what ideas could I bring here and apply to this sector to adapt to this new situation or to improve my situation? That's exactly what I mean by a prepared mind or a prepared country, is having an innovative capacity that can do that. Um, that is the website for the Productivity Project. You can download these things free. Um, so please do, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Maloney, for such a uh, very comprehensive um, presentation. Now, um, before we go for a 15-minute break, may I request uh, all speakers to please join Dr. Maloney and Dr. Reyes for a photo ops on stage. I request all speakers for the entire symposium to please join Dr. Maloney and Dr. Reyes on stage for the photo for the photo opportunity. For the rest of uh, the uh, audience, you may now have your coffee.
Industrial Revolution. Given that this revolution demands attention, we made it the central theme of this year's Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM. Every September, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies leads the entire nation in celebrating the DPRM to emphasize the importance of policy research in the formulation of appropriate policy interventions to emerging and current development concerns. The fourth industrial revolution is here. Let us use it to our advantage. Fourth Industrial Revolution is here. Let us use it to our advantage. from rapidly changing technologies, urbanization, climate change, protectionism, and conflict-driven extremism in, in some parts of the world. It is important for the Filipino people, collectively and individually, to understand fire, this fourth industrial revolution, and the nature 
of the needed application. There are tremendous new opportunities that come uh, with it. The biggest issue I'd like to put on the table is the workforce um, of the future. They have to be cognizant, I guess, of, uh, of all these issues, um, and they have to be adept and comfortable with this. We need, as uh, institutions and as private sectors, to completely reskill our workforce in many areas. The point is that the tool sets we have today allows for competition to emerge from the industry entrants that you never thought were competitors, just as they now enable traditional incumbents to leverage these technologies to launch innovative new products, services, and business models. So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or BIDS, has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, BIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Truth Policy Research. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. Kung nahuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad. At kung walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective!
In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI uh -oh. is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PA. Good morning, everyone. We'll be starting in uh, two minutes. So may I request everyone to please go back to your seats. Please go back to your seats now as we are about to start the morning session. Is everyone okay? Is everyone ready? Yes. Good. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I am Sheila Sierra of uh, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, and it's, it is my honor and privilege to chair and moderate this session. So let us begin our conversation by listening to what the industry sector has to say about the fourth industrial revolution. And so um, this session is intended to give us a better understanding of um, how certain industries are using uh, new and emerging technologies to innovate their products and services, um, to um, improve their internal and external operations, which may be uh, bringing about new um, business models, new business platforms that are challenging our existing regulatory frameworks. Okay? And uh, we will also have an opportunity to hear what our speakers uh, have to say about the regulatory challenges or regulatory issues that are impeding um, their efforts uh, to innovate. And so uh, to achieve this objective, we have invited representatives from uh, certain um, industries uh, where um, uh, significant things are um, going on, and this include uh, uh, the uh, banking and um, finance sector, the transport sector, and the health sector. And uh, for a more focused discussion, we asked them to um, answer some guide questions, which you can see on the screen, and allow me to um, read them briefly. So how is technology changing your industry and the industry's boundaries, both locally and globally? What are the new products and processes being developed? How can the Philippines benefit from these innovations what are the enabling factors and what are the regu regulatory constraints or gaps which inhibit innovation or the introduction of new goods and services? Okay, so we are giving each presenter 20 minutes and uh, may I ask each presenter to um, be mindful of the time and we have um, a timekeeper, Carla, who will um, um, help us in uh, managing the time. 
So I think we are ready to start, okay? So our first presenter is Dr. Justo Ortiz, the chairman of the Union Bank of the Philippines. And prior to working with Union Bank, Dr. Ortiz had a successful 14-year stint with uh, Citibank, and he's also the founding chairman of the Blockchain Association of the Philippines and concurrently shares the Philippine Payments Management Incorporated, a critical component of the National Retail Payment Systems Framework. He is also the co-founder and chairman of Tech Up Pilipinas, a movement that aims to push for inclusive prosperity by helping small and medium enterprises, individuals, and large corporations benefit from technological advancements. Friends, Dr. Justo Ortiz. Okay, thank you and good morning. I've titled my presentation about rethinking uh, regulations in the fourth industrial age, FIRE, as it's uh, called, that's a good acronym, as who can we trust? Because at the end of the day, what is the primary mandate of regulation? We say it's safety, security, protection, transparency, level playing field, etc. But the bottom line is regulation is to build trust in our society, build trust in our interactions with each other. Unfortunately, trust has a cost. And that's one of the things that we talk about in blockchain, about how the cost of trust using middlemen that provide trust in interactions peer to peer cost us money. So bear with me. I think the first thing that we need to rethink are not the methodologies of regulation, but the mindset, the mindset of regulators and the mindset of regulation. And I want to show you a, a rather long film, but bear with me. And uh, can you play this? Gwen? <laughs> Few institutions would dare to encourage self-trust. Instead, most authorities teach us to become placid participants in various systems. They do not teach us to be happy. If anything, they underline the dangers of freedom and the importance of control. Because these notions are so common in our schools and churches, at the dinner table and on the evening news, we begin to learn what we think is a universal truth. We must hold ourselves together. We learn that if we let ourselves go, we will become evil, lazy, savage. We learn the importance of pressure and restraint. To repress our genuine desires because they're incompatible with society's expectations. expectations. We learn that if we are not doing well in a school subject or a self-improvement plan, then we are not pushing ourselves hard enough. We learn that people who succeed are examples of this kind of pushing. We learn that those who stop doing something only because it feels wrong are lazy. Even people who oppose one institution's dogma often end up buying into another's. It is difficult to escape these teachings because they are so ubiquitous. Humans are pattern-seeking, storytelling animals. From the world around you, you have learned which patterns to seek and which stories to tell. Conscious inner conversation has helped you mimic the people around you rather than understand yourself better. When you learn from a young age to fear, ignore, and suppress parts of your experience, you can only tell half the story. You remain an acquaintance to your reflection instead of an intimate friend.
To live how you feel is right takes the same effort as to live how you're told is right. The work is the same. What is different is the reward. No amount of approval and no size of achievement can ever fill the space reserved for your opinion of yourself. Of course, in the real world, we need both. We cannot live only by our own expectations. I wouldn't suggest driving on the opposite side of the road simply because you feel that it's right. Self-trust is not about rebellion. And it's not about hedonism. It's about realizing that all your experiences, your thoughts, your emotions, your dreams are valid. They exist for a reason. Accepting this reality does not require you to believe each thought, act on each emotion, or fulfill each dream. Quite the contrary, embracing each part of your experience gives you the ability to understand it, explore it, and integrate it. Instead of labeling your emotions as problems to solve, you can see them as signals to interpret. Instead of judging your desires as shameful aberrations, you can learn to meet them in healthier ways. Instead of calling yourself critical names when you cannot build or break certain habits, you can explore your motivations. You can become a student of yourself rather than always seeking a wiser teacher. So is it right? only because we're told it's right? Is that how we're operating? Then it comes to this. In the fourth industrial age, we've seen already what China is doing in terms of the social scorecard. But we don't know what IoT information they're picking up. We don't know what AI engine they're using. We don't know what algorithms are being used, but the the meaning of it is clear. You do what we tell you is right, and you'll be rewarded. You do go against what we tell you is right, and you will be penalized. And you don't really even know what data is being gathered, how it's being processed to come to this conclusion. Yet if we continue going along this line that we've decided, where we don't trust ourselves, where our mindset is one where regulation is a system of control rather than a system to build human progress, a system to be a catalyst of innovation, a catalyst of growth, a system that is a foundation of our humanity, right? Then we will get into that problem where the rule maker and the rule making in the fourth industrial age will be a big block box. And a lot of, and there are options. So we're very much in school, you've gone to ethics classes and we've learned about Kant, of course, which is the main regulatory framework, which is we'll make the rules, you follow the rules regardless of outcome and you're well behaved, you're doing good. Society should reward you. But there are alternatives. Beltham's utilitarianism, which is the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Plato's universal truth and virtue. Now, this sounds, what did I do here? So if we continue along this path where regulation as a mindset is more a system of control rather than a system for developing, then you go through this path where eventually AI will be making the rules through natural language and machine learning will begin to discern through the millions and billions of data points that 
people are generating, what sort of behaviors are to be encouraged, and what sort of behaviors are to be discouraged, and we won't even know why that is the case. So I think the alternative is to design human-centered, and I think this was in the speech of uh, the president of PIDS, human-centered ethical frameworks. And we need to start rethinking regulation from a mindset point of view. So I'm spending a lot of time here, not on the technicals of regulation, so I'll, although I'll get into that, but more on the idea that what is the purpose of regulation? It's to build trust. And we cannot start from, the starting point cannot be that we cannot trust ourselves as individuals. And we need Big Brother or AI to help us build a society where trust is at the foundation. Now, can this be done? We've done this in uh, Union Bank, uh, in our part of our digital transformation story. We have like over almost 50 million transactions a year. And the moments of truth are a few seconds. So the decision making in terms of customer engagement cannot be through a manual or a script or a rule or whatever. Sometimes rules need to be broken. But under what conditions? We did a survey. One of our values is integrity. I think that's simple, right? Everybody knows what integrity is. Well, guess what? When we did a survey in our group, in the bank, 3,000 people, there were, I think, 63 interpretations of what integrity is. All right, by the way. All right, right? But it's a little bit of a divergent, all ethical. So we did something that's very normal for us as human beings. How do we pass tradition from one culture to the next? How do we build that culture? Through storytelling. So we have 8,000 stories now that we call DNA stories, where people in the field, even the lowest level tellers, make decisions on the spot, some of it breaking our rules, not the law, but breaking some of our rules, not following the manuals, not following whatever procedures they are, but it was values-based, which is Aristotle, and purpose-led, which was Beltham. And it was not purely a compliance-based system of regulation. So that's the point that I want to make. Now, getting into the technicals, all the questions that you asked me. So what are the key tra challenges of uh, regulation, right? So the first is the mindset. What's the mindset that the regulation regulator needs to have in this new age, right? And a lot of this discussion of cryptocurrencies and et cetera is because, yeah, we might say that we don't trust ourselves, our individual, which I don't buy, but neither are the institutions being trusted. So there's a lot of mistrust. If you do surveys, I mean, hardly any rulemaking institution gets a survey score higher than 50% in trust. There are very few. Most are below that. Yet these are the same institutions that we're trusting to make the rules that add to our development as humans in our specific uh, society. So what are the business challenges? One is the pacing. Pacing is the speed, so I think we know that. But the most critical thing is the iterative approach of, um, of uh, rulemaking, of technology. So that's number one. So most of new technologies are minimum value propositions. They're put to market, and there's a feedback loop. Our convergent app, mobile app, Union Bank, was launched about 11 months ago and has gone through 50 iterations already. Can you imagine if for every iteration we needed to go to the regulator? It would never happen. Right? So it's continuous feedback, feedback. We report, but our regulator doesn't say, before you touch anything there, you need a prior approval. 
That's not how it works, thank God. But that's really one, the major issue, that the new developments are iterative, right? How do rules get made? You go through this whole study, then the rules get made months and months, maybe PIDS starts the process or whoever. Then they send it to public hearing or whatever, get comments. Those comments are built in and blah, blah, blah. And maybe one year later, sometimes five years later, you have a rule and that's it. You make the rule and you forget about it. Follow this for the rest of your life, right? So that's the first business channel. Next is the disruptive models. So most of the rules are paper and words. It involves people, it involves processes. But what if there are no paper and there are no words? What, they're just bits and bytes. What if there are no people? It's just bots. RPA, robotic process automations, or AI. What if there are no processes, just a black box? So this is one of the things that we think. But the most important, so that's one big thing, but the other big thing is that many of us are now, rules are usually vertical to a sector or lateral, like, um, you know, business permits, licensing, or, or, or employment, there are very few rules that are convergent. So that's the next challenge. We in the bank, for example, are building platforms. How do we, uh, we're building a logistics platform, for example, and embedding the banking there, right? So that payments, lending, Etc. get done automated as part of a logistic supply chain. Who's going to regulate that, right? So that's the first point. Then technological challenges. I think we all know about data, privacy, and all that stuff. So that's clearly important. AI, I kind of described the black box already. We call AI and these black boxes Weapons of math destruction. Instead of mass, math, M-A-T-H. Because we really don't know what it is, and we think it's unbiased, it's biased. There's bias, it's been proven. So what do we do? So I think we need to go from uh, prescriptive regulation to outcome-based regulation, more progressive, and we need to start with a review process. In some European countries, they already have this, uh, I don't know what they call it, it's like a regulation fit and something review process, which they do on purpose, because the regulations are many outdated. Then stage two is testing who, when to regulate, and I'll clear that up in the next phases. And then the regulatory approach, which you can go from minimum to light to more heavy-handed. But the important part is stage four, revisit. This needs to be now entered into the regulatory framework. You can't go through this law. I mean, if you make a law, that really puts it in stone. But even on a regulatory basis, it can't be something that you do and never change. There needs to be dynamism, because there's dynamism on the innovation front. So what principles do we adopt? Adaptive regulation. So I talked about the first part. I'm chairman of the uh, Philippine Payments Management Inc. So one of the ways of, I guess, soft regulation, if you want to call it, versus hard, is SRO, self-regulating organizations, codes of conduct, industry, guidelines, third-party accreditation and review. So these are alternatives of adaptive regulation. So I'm working in the payment space, which is highly innovative with fintechs and all this stuff. And the central bank has a framework, but there's an SRO, which is PPMI, which is actually making the rules. So it's an industry-led rule-making activity supervised. Regulatory sandbox, we have that too. So we have two or three projects where the regulator regulations don't exist or are wrong or don't work. We do the project on the sandbox, 
And when the central bank is thing, we go into pilot and so forth and so on, right? So that already happens in our experience. And it's also a great way to deal with these regulatory challenges I mentioned. Outcome-based regulation, focus on results rather than the inputs, right? So what are the results the central bank wants from us in the payment space? We want that by 2020, 20% 20 of Filipinos will be doing their payment transactions digitally from one or 2% today. So it's not how to do it. They're not telling us how to do. They're not telling us what to do. They're telling us what you need to do. What outcome should be the result of this particular payments exercise? Risk-weighted regulation, same thing, right? Big problem in the Philippines, KYC, Unbank, 70%, right? What do you do? So again, the SRO makes rules. Now the challenge of risk-weighted on other industries will be the data collection because you need to make a risk assessment and the risk assessment is a product of data collection and the analysis of that data. So, but in our case, unbanked, how do you bank the unbanked? You can't tell them do 11 IDs, give me the birth certificate, blah, blah, blah. Some of them don't even have that. So for large corporations, middle class people, you can do that. But for the, if your goal, so that's the second goal of the central bank outcome, digital, and bank the unbanked. We need to have risk-weighted regulation. For somebody with 5,000 peso de balance, you can't put the whole book on AMLA for them to follow. It's not relevant, right? So what's more important, your AMLA rule or your, or your banking the unbanked outcome that you want to happen? And there have been lots of discussions, by the way, on this subject. And of course, collaborative regulation, I think that was spoken to about, not only among industries, because I talked about platforms where you, have, you need convergent regulation in one industry. Uh, what's an autonomous vehicle? Is it supposed to be done by, uh, by transportation? will rule them, yeah, but there's, a, you know, like I, I think there's a speaker from Grab here. You know, Grab has Grab Pay, so that's a payment. So are they gonna be regulated by LTFRB or by Banco Central or both, right? And so forth and so on, right? They might do other things. And then they're hired or not hired and whatever, so that's a dole issue. So here's an example of a technology where you have convergent regulatory bodies involved in the regulation, but the rules are not convergent. They're vertical, okay? So we need more of that. Internationally, for the banks, is critical. And the leader here is Singapore. Singapore already has, I think, 15 or 16 bilateral agreements, including with our central bank, basically to coordinate rulemaking interoperability. So this is so critical, interoperability of technologies. There are different standards, different requirements. You know, you can't be in your own, you know, barangay. Re you really need to connect to the rest of the world, to the rest of the country, to all people. So interoperability becomes critical. So I'd like to end back where I started and quote, I guess since there are a lot of economists here, a Nobel Prize winning economist, one of my favorite, Eleanor Ostrom, who debunked the tragedy of the commons and made principles of how a collaborative commons can actually work. And I like this statement of her, I hope it, she, which says, there is no reason that politicians and bureaucrats, no matter how well-meaning, are better at solving problems than the people on the spot who have the greatest incentive to get the solutions right. So I guess, 
Is, is regulation supposed to be a top-down, big brother, I know everything that's good for you, just follow the rules? Or do we need a more holistic mindset, right? Values-based, purpose-led, where regulation can be a catalyst to human progress, where humanity is, continues to be championed as an important integral part of how we interact with each other in a system of trust that we can create using regulations, of course, but regulations that are adaptive, regulations that are collaborative, regulations that are outcome-based, regulations that are agile. And I think this is really the challenge that we need going forward, how to make this a reality for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ortiz, for your very insightful uh, remarks. Now, I'm sure you have um, some questions, comments for Dr. Ortiz, so please park them for now because we still have two more presenters. So he uh, made a really good segue uh, to our next presenter when he, when, um, he talked about uh, Grab and uh, the seemingly uh, lack of uh, convergence when it comes to uh, regulating this new business model. So our next presenter, um, Friends is the original policy and research manager of Grab, where she helps cities in Southeast Asia address key development challenges using data and technology. And uh, prior to joining Grab, she was a research fellow with the Max Planck Institute for Research on Collective Goods and with the Max Planck Institute of Economics in Germany. Friends, Dr. Marian Panganiban, the regional policy and research manager of Grab. Hello, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. So thank you, it, it is a pleasure to speak in front of a very distinguished audience. So thank you, PIDS, PIDS for the opportunity. So yeah, I'm Marianne, and I'm with Grab. And it's great that Dr. Ortiz started this session talking about trust. Because I think when you have trust, it's much more easier to collaborate. And I think in this day and age, Industry 4.0, you, you will be able to drive innovation through collaboration. And for that to happen, you need trust. And the myth of the lone genius, the singular inventor, that's no longer applicable right now because collaboration or innovation happens through partnerships, through groups, and through multi sectoral um, um, partnerships. Okay, so let me start by talking about, yeah, Grab. So, here and wh where we are in the region so we are in 336 cities in eight countries and we have served over 2 billion rides across the region and we have more than 8.5 million um, micro entrepreneurs in the platform so if before we started as a ride hailing service you have now expanded into an online to offline um, service enabling merchants and agents to deliver food in other countries to deliver goods and services in rural parts of, the, of Indonesia, for example. And we ha have now over 125 million downloads. So we started Grab to solve a real problem in Southeast Asia. I remember our COO telling us why, you know, when they were brainstorming about, you know, when they were starting Grab, and she was a consultant back then in Kuala Lumpur. And she would work late nights and take the cab, let's say at 12 midnight or 1 a.m. in the morning uh, to go home. And of course, she would hail a cab from the street or maybe call the service and she would get the cab. And when she got into the cab, what she would do is she would call her brother or her mother and pretend, hey, even if there was no one on the line, just pretend that she, there was someone on the other end of the line saying, just so the driver will know that there is someone there waiting for her. 
and you know, don't do anything shady. So this is something that resonated with me because that was something that I would do when I was in Manila, when I would take late night cab rides back like six, seven years ago. And that was the problem that Grab wanted to solve back then. It was how to deliver safe rides for female passengers. And so that was one of the first features we developed was sh what we call the share my ride feature, which allowed other people to track your ride. So you can send your, send your family, your friends, hey, this is the number of the cab, cab or taxi that I'm riding. This is where I am right now. You can do that through SMS, you can do that through the app. So we started by addressing safety, but then we realized that the troves of the data that we were collecting, the very technology that allowed you to send um, information about your ride, once you anonymize it, once you aggregate it, you're, you can actually track the traffic patterns in the city. You can actually build maps out of it. And it's very critical in a region like Southeast Asia, wherein maps aren't very well developed. If you compare, let's say, the, Google, the level of detail of Google Map, let's say, in a city in Indonesia like Medan or Makassar, versus, let's say, London, the level of detail there would be very different. And that's why being able to collect data about that, if you're a city planner or if you're someone working in public service delivery, and you're, let's say, planning, um, uh, relief efforts during a disaster, being able to access those maps easily is something that would be very helpful for you. And so we've moved past that, or we've moved from that, from addressing safety to looking at impacts on traffic congestion, and also looking at other ways through which we can improve the income, incomes of driver partners and merchants in our platform. So, so what I'm doing here right now is I'm, start, I'm building it from the ground up. So later I'll talk about the regulatory issues. Um, so what we try to do is we try to create localized data-driven services and value adds that are relevant uh, to users across Southeast Asia. So there are things, for example, that are available only here in the Philippines. Like we have Grab Trike in Angeles, Pampanga. But we don't have that, let's say, in Singapore. We have something like Grab Remork or Grab Tuk Tuk in Phnom Penh, which you won't find, let's say, in Kuala Lumpur. But we also offer like Grab Taxi, Grab Car, Grab Shuttle. Um, we also have what we call Just Grab, which allows you with a single tap of a button, it's not available here in the Philippines, to call in the supply of taxis and cars. So what that allows you as a passenger is that you get access to a bigger supply, shorter waiting times, and also cheaper rides. And what that allows for driver partners is that they're able to access more passengers. Okay. So that's something that's available in other countries, but not in the Philippines. So we try to contextualize supply optimization efforts through that. We're also setting up building blocks of a multimodal future for different markets in Southeast Asia. When we looked at, when we've analyzed the usage of Grab in countries like Indonesia and Malaysia, what we've learned is that they're using it to, like a, a significant portion use it to ride to public transit stops. So they take, let's say, a Grab, grab car to, let's say, the MRT or bus station, then they take the bus, and then from the bus station, they take another grab ride. So looking at this first mile, last mile linkages, plugging the gaps in existing public transport, this is something that we want to improve on. And we're talking with um, different cities in how to better integrate our services in the existing public transport um, ecosystem. And Dr. Ortiz mentioned a while ago about Grab Pay. So we do have a payments wallet, or, or a, a Grab Pay, or a, a wallet within the app. And that is also a way of supporting the cashless drive within the region. So if in the Philippines we're now at 2%, we do want to enable more users, given that we have such a large user base, to tap into, that, into services that have previously not been available to them through, Grab, through the Grab Pay wallet. Okay. So the strategy here is really what we call an open platform strategy, which means working closely with strong local partners and also with governments. So we've mentioned in the previous talk, it was mentioned about human-centered design. Now we're also talking about people-centric development. And it, not just in terms of the policies, but actually in terms of, of the features that we develop within the app. Um, we're also working closely, as I've said, with 
with governments, not just in transport, but also in e-commerce and tourism. Like we work closely with the government, uh, with this, with the regional government in Java for to support Bali tourism, healthcare, and education. All this to support our user base of more than 100 million users, and across eight countries. So if there is a saying, right, that it takes a village to raise a child. We also believe in Grab that it takes an ecosystem for a startup like Grab to thrive. And we need more Grabs, we need more startups in order for this whole thing, for, for innovation to really happen here in this part of the world. So right now, Grab is the only Southeast Asian tech company that has valued more than, more than $10 billion. We want there to be more more companies like this. And we're trying to jumpstart that ecosystem here in the region. So we're looking into building national and regional champions, looking at startups that already have market traction and have already introduced innovative products, and to be able to allow them to access the markets that we have already tapped into, provide mentorship, and also our tech expertise in order to grow these companies. And if in the past industrial revolution, it, it was about economies of scale, right? So it was about competitive advantage could be had through economies of scale. As we move to Industry 4.0, we're now looking into mass customization. So it's still about scale, but now we're looking to hyper-individualized services that will allow users to get services that are, that are matched to their preferences at that specific time. So when you, let's say when you type a, a search phrase in Google, it will yield different results for each of us de depending on our search history. The location recommendations for you and Grab will be different depending on your past, um, your past trips. And eventually the services that will be immediately available to you will be different based on your history, based on how you've been using the app. And this kind of, innovation can unlock exponential benefits for different people. So consumers can enjoy more convenient, affordable, and reliable services to improve their quality of life. Micro-entrepreneurs now gain access to new markets. If before the cost of entering an, a business, or the cost of starting a business is much higher, now we're able to lower those costs and make it easier for them to tap markets that are no longer limited by geographical, um, by geographical constraints. And businesses can also expand, can help expand the economic pie. Benefits of new products and processes can spill over to different industries. And governments, of course, can benefit, um, can benefit from platforms, not only as users of the platforms themselves, but, they're also, uh, but it also enables them to fulfill their mandate to serve their citizens. Ultimately, like the passengers and driver partners in Grab are also voters, they're also citizens they care about you know they care about safety they care about um, getting us getting uh, they care about having less traffic or so these are things that regulators also should be able to solve and as I've said the approach has always been collaborative and we try to look at ways into which our technology can serve the purposes of the government so now we talk about how regulation can support this kind of growth. And this is a quite a difficult subject because as mentioned in the previous talk, we are now d dealing across, uh, we are now in different verticals and it's important that there be a convergent regulatory framework instead of like lo looking at these things in silos. And if you, this is a very rough overview about of regulatory frameworks in the region. And if you look at countries that have adaptable leg legal frameworks to digital business models, so you have versus that's their co global competitiveness. So you have Singapore there on top. And you also have Malaysia there on second. And from our experience, this, these were the countries wherein it has been quite easy, or wherein the conversations have been much more fluid when it comes to um, regulations. And it's also no wonder that these are also the countries that have benefited the most from Grab services. And you have a country like Indonesia in third in adaptable legal frameworks and fourth in global competitiveness. And I think as, 
a regulator, there is um, the default is to plan your rules based on the parameters of the past and the present. And that's expected because that's the information that's immediately available to you. But you also have to think that you're actually setting the rules for the future. And us in the industry, we're also conscious of that. In a way, we're all making bets about what the future would look like. We're doing that, let's say, as a, as a tech company, we're doing that by spending the money, by investing on R&D centers, by attracting talent, driving them to build these products. As a regulator, as government officials, you're making those bets through the rules that you make. You're looking at, OK, this is how I imagine things to look like 10 years from now. And for that future to happen, this, these are the rules that I, would, that I would like to have. And I think we all have to approach this with some level of humility, knowing that we don't know what we don't know. Um, I think this is mentioned in the in Dr. Maloney's talk, like firms don't know what they don't know. So that's something that we are aware of in Grab. And I think this is also something that government officials should be conscious of. And that's why it takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of patience also to learn from other industries and to learn from other sectors when it comes to designing the regulatory frameworks. So our experience in Grab, it's always good to have like a set of principles so that you can achieve that coherent policy Policy, coherent policies in the end. And as a case study, so we've looked into shared mobility. And Grab is a signatory of what we call the shared mobility principles for livable cities. So these are principles designed by cities across the world, by public and private transport operators, by ride-hailing companies like Uber, um, Ola, Grab. and. It's a long list, so it's like 10 principles, but I'm going to highlight three. So the first is there needs to be active engagement between public and private sector. So there has to be a robust learning, planning, and decision-making processes for, mobili for mobility so solutions to thrive. And, there needs, and the emphasis, as I've said in the title, is on collaboration. There has to be a set of uh, there has to be a regular exchange, and forums like this are really great for that, although I feel like I'm preaching to the converted here already. We should also look at uh, enabling the public benefits of open data. Interoperability was mentioned in the previous talk, and it's important for us because the future of mobility, and I think this is also applicable for other industries, should allow for interoperability. Different systems should be able to talk to each other, not just on the tech aspect, but also in terms of the regulations. So, mobi so the transport can no longer be agnostic or could to, let's say, what's happening in finance or what's happening in e-commerce. So there should be that conversation. There is conversation taking place on the private sector side, but there are that those conversations should also be happening in the side of regulators and government so that we can ensure privacy, security, and accountability. And there should also be integrated services for seamless connectivity, um, which, which can facilitate interoperable payments and information sharing between ride-sharing platforms like Grab, government bodies, and other transport operators, let's say your buses, your MRTs. And so far in our experience, we try our best to work closely, as I've said, with government. And you, we have established an AI lab with NUS. And the gains, the, the outputs there aren't necessarily, let's say, products for Grab, but rather products for the broader public. So we're looking at ways and how our data can solve traffic congestion and improve road safety in Southeast Asia. We're also working closely with the Singapore Urban Redevelopment Authority to study public transit commutes since they have access to public transit data and we have access to the private transport side to help reshape urban infrastructure and technology in Singapore. We're also, our team is also working closely with UNDP in Cambodia to introduce green fleets in Phnom Penh and in other cities in the, in the country and to improve traffic safety and efficiency in, the, in Cambodia. So these are just some of our, some examples to sort of guide um, regulators, or just to give you an idea, because I know here in the Philippines, the conversation of, of Grab here is still very much limited on the transport side. But if you can think about how 
other ways through which that very technology can be used to empower entrepreneurs to also work across different industries and to also actually serve um, government purposes, then I think it would make the conversation more productive. And it was mentioned a while ago how important it, has, it is to have those conversations, and I'm very happy to have this forum for that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Panganiban. So I'm very happy at how the uh, different presentations are flowing because we can see uh, common themes and cross-cutting issues. And uh, from um, transport, now we go to health, okay? So last but definitely not the least in our roster of presenters this morning is Ms. Phoebe Jane Elizaga, who is the head of public sector and policy of M Clinica, a social enterprise building digital networks of pharmacies all over Asia. Prior to joining M Clinica, she worked with the UP Manila National Telehealth Center and contributed to initiatives such as electronic medical records and telemedicine, biomedical services special design for the geographical isolated and disadvantaged communities. Friends, Ms. Phoebe Jane Elizaga of M Clinica. Good morning, everyone. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Thank you, Dr. Sheila, for that introduction. Uh, M Clinica is uh, immensely honored and privileged to have been invited in this important but exciting occasion alongside with these esteemed uh, organizations and institutions. Okay. Public health is something important to all of us. It is actually the science of protecting and improving the health care of people and communities. It is further defined as uh, to how government, private sectors, INGOs work together to support uh, not only the individual's health, but population at large. So today, I will be discussing to you about how technology can provide positive impact to public health care. Now, when we think about healthcare innovation, we think about this, electronic medical records, telemedicine, uh, application of IoT or Internet of Things, wearables, and even to the deep uh, pharmacogenomics. But the question is this, as to what extent is this relevant to the public health setup. Fortunately, the Philippines is not behind. We are catching up. However, pharmacies and pharmacists are often overlooked because these technologies here, as we can see, are, are, are mostly uh, in service to hospitals, doctors, but really uh, no pharmacies and pharmacists. So at M Clinica, everything that we do is really to help pharmacists and pharmacies uh, provide impact to public health because we believe that they are crucial and critical part of public health. Now I'm going, I'm going to talk to you about um, M Clinica and how we are actually doing uh, uh, impact or using technology to impact public health. So our team is composed of different backgrounds. We have healthcare, we have also technologies, so doctors, nurses, in fact, more than 20% of our team are pharmacists and pharmacy assistants. We also have computer scientists, data scientists, engineers. All of these different backgrounds work together to understand and you know, analyze the pain points in the pharmacy channel and try to come up with a solution uh, to advance care, okay? So M Clinica operates uh, in Southeast Asia, okay? So we currently are running uh, six countries, 
Okay, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. But honestly, Philippines has a very special place in our heart because this, is, uh, this was our first market. So Philippines was our first market, and uh, we are very committed to in helping uh, public health or improve public health here. Presently, we are supported by uh, aid agencies and several public sector organizations. So these are the organizations who believe in us and who believe uh, in what we do. Okay. At M Clinica, we have developed three major platforms, okay? And all of these are mobile applications. So these are SwiperX, Connect, and EDSS. So first is SwiperX. SwiperX is the consolidated digi digital channel connecting to 120,000 pharmacy professionals, connecting 20,000 pharmacies, and reaching to an estimated 100 or 100 million patients every month across these uh, six countries. So what is SwiperX? So SwiperX is basically uh, a channel for all pharmacies to have access to never been before, you know, um, mobile-based continuing professional development modules. So in there, uh, pharmacists or pharmacy professionals are able to gain access to free CBDs for them to get updated with the, uh, public health and eventually deliver patient, better patient care. Secondly is Connect. So Connect is the, our pharmacy-driven uh, patient program, which provides a discount on medicine up to 40%. And this is the first of its kind, which is mobile-based, uh, and it's running um, in Southeast Asia. And finally, I will be focusing my talk today on EDSS, or the Electronic Drug Safety System. It is our government platform which allows the government to monitor prescription data and to monitor the pharmacy activities. Okay? All right. Now, let's take a look at the screen. Since 1969, these logbooks have been required. According to RA 10918, or the Philippine Pharmacy Act of 2016, pharmacists are required to write down prescription information in a logbook. However, as we can see again in the screen, it seems to be very tedious, difficult, repetitive. Hence, it's really impractical. Let's take, for example, this pharmacist. She is Maria. Maria went to school for four to five uh, years in pharmacy school. And uh, you know, as soon as she passed the board exam, she is expected to actually do her primary job, which is to counsel patients, you know, educate pa patients about drug-to-drug -drug interaction or indication, contraindication of drugs. But she ended up writing down prescription in the, or information in a, in a paper-based logbook, which is really a complete waste of time. On the other hand, the FDA. As we understand that any government agencies here in the Philippines, they sometimes lack uh, res uh, access to resources. And as for the FDA, they lack resources in terms of infrastructure. Infrastructure. They lack uh, access to all these pharmacies across the country. And they also lack uh, resources or, or strategy to actually get all those data coming from the uh, pharmacies in order for them to provide data to the DOH for the DOH to understand all the statistical data and be able to develop programs and policies for them to uh, to decrease or to yeah to decrease this uh, diseases in certain localities. Okay, so at M Clinica we always ask our question ourselves. So what if we digitize this logbook and then give that data to the FDA and government? And that's exactly what we did. We have developed this mobile app called EDSS, or the Electronic Drug uh, Safety System. For the first time, the FDA 
Oh, by the way, EDSS is a platform in which it can now uh, collect prescription information coming from the pharmacy level and then be automatically uh, submitted to the FDA. For the FDA now to completely analyze what's happening in the, uh, in the pharmacy level across the country. So now FDA, for the first time, has now access to all this integrated um, health information coming from all these pharmacies across the country. And for the first time, the government and FDA will now have full ownership of this data. And this data uh, does not cover any patient uh, identifiable information. So now, Maria, this pharmacist, and other, uh, the rest of the pharmacists in the Philippines are becoming champions to public health by simply complying with this new policy uh, from the FDA to adopt this EDSS uh, mobile app and submit all the uh, prescription information to the FDA. So we hope that looking forward, you know, this data will be put into important use and will and will be able to contribute to better uh, public health management. Sure, tech is very interesting. But how about data? So using EDSS, we have provided new insights on two major uh, public health concerns in the Philippines, okay? namely AMR and TB. So AMR is the antimicrobial resistance. AMR refers to the um, microbe that which, you know, thrive or which if exposed, if and when exposed to a, a antimicrobial uh, agent will still survive, which, which still survive, which is previously an effective treatment. So the reason why it's happening is that uh, because of lack of education or maybe they didn't comply to the prescription of the doctor. So based on our data, 77% of the patients buy antibiotics in less than uh, 14 pills. The standard um, prescription for antibiotics, for example, here in the Philippines is 21 pills because we have three take three times a day for seven days. That's the usual standard prescription. So compare the difference, 21 versus 14. That's a huge gap, right? So next is the TB or tuberculosis. So TB is one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality here in the Philippines. While it's deadly, it is treatable and curable for six months by medicine like called uh, Quantab. However, based on this study, we've observed that 52% of the time, patients buy individual medicine. They adhere to monotherapy instead of the Quantab or the uh, four medicine. Okay, so this is how EDSS provide new insights uh, for public health. Finally, a policy has been enacted. You know? So last June 27, uh, 2018, a policy was signed mandating uh, the use of the electronic drug safety system by pharmacies nationwide. So this is between the M Clinica and FDA organizations. So so, and we are expected to roll out nationwide this year, hoping to revolutionize uh, healthcare in a very practical way, okay? Now the questions, what are the <coughs> regulatory challenges that we've faced? So firstly, before we jump into this journey, amazing journey of trying to improve public health, we know that we knew that back then that there will be challenges. Okay, so it was already in our mind that, okay, there will be some con uh, regulatory consideration and legal considerations that we need to take. So these are the considerations. These are not challenges for us, but considerations that we need to um, address. So firstly is the Philippine Pharmacy Act of 2016. So we need to align with the law on the uh, Prescri the mandate of writing down prescription in a logbook. So every so everyone in this uh, or stakeholders in this act, we've actually met with them.
Okay? Next is the Data Privacy Act of 2012. We understand and we recognize that we need to actually protect the patient's privacy. So that's why we've, uh, we've also designed our system that no patient identifiable, and identifiable information will ever be recorded and submitted. And thirdly, of course, on how to announce or inform stakeholders about this new way of doing things, right? So the strategies that we actually uh, did in order for us to uh, address those considerations are this. So we did multi-sectoral collaboration, capacity building, government policy, and we also uh, developed this sustainability model. Okay, so for the multi-sectoral collaboration with the leadership and help of the FDA, we were able to meet pharmacies, pharmacists, uh, association, the academe, international NGOs, for us to actually inform or to raise awareness about this uh, new initiative. It is very important at the very early start of any initiative, uh, we need to recognize that everyone in the uh, stakeholder or end user should be in the loop. So that's what we did. And then number two, capacity building. So the end user of this EDSS is, or is the pharmacist, okay? So for them to be able to understand this um, process, we conducted a pilot run last 2015, okay? And until now, they're still using it. Why? Because they love it. They are enjoying uh, the new innovation in, in this uh, mobile app, okay? And they are in fact, and they are uh, in in fact um, trying to uh, push us to actually don't give up because there's a lot of challenges really in terms of you know dealing with this um, uh, regulation, etc. So government policy, we cannot do this alone. Of course, if if yeah, we cannot do no, we can never do this alone. So government policy in in terms of you know a circular should. There should be a mandate, a strict mandate or enforcement to actually adopt this system to the pharmacist. Because if it's just us, uh, private sector, who will be telling these pharmacists to use this, they will never listen to us. So it's very important for the FDA, for the government, to actually come into the picture. And now the sustainability model. So apart from the circular and the uh, policy uh, aspect, um, the sustainability model here is really the collaboration between, uh, of all among uh, stakeholders, right? So by the way, we have donated, so M Clinic had donated this EDSS to the FDA and government. So we never um, asked for payment for this. So at M Clinica, we believe that regulatory challenges are part of any healthcare innovation. And we are just harmonizing together with stakeholders to make it work, not in a matter of months, but de decades. And we want to make it work now. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And I will uh, show you two more videos. One is how EDSS works, and the other uh, is the uh, testimonial coming from the pharmacist. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the day. Ito si Maria, isa siyang community pharmacist na nagdedispense ng gamot at nagsusulat sa isang logbook ng mga impormasyong nakikita sa reseta ng mga pasyente. Ngunit dahil dito, maraming nasasayang na oras si Maria sa pagsusulat nito sa halip na gawin ang kanyang pangunahing tungkulin, ang tumulong at magbigay payo sa mga pasyente. Ngayong taon, Gustong baguhin ng FDA Philippines ang sistemang ito upang lalo pang makatulong sa mga pharmacists. Sa pamamagitan ng panibagong circular ng FDA tungkol sa adoption of electronic logbook for pharmacies, maaari nang gamitin ni Maria ang isang mobile app para masunod niya ang batas 
at makatulong sa FDA, pangalagaan ang publiko laban sa paso at peking gamot gamit ang real-time recall messages. Dahil sa simpleng paglipat mula sa papel patungo sa electronic logbook, maaari na nating malaman at mabigyang aksyon ang mga malaking suliranin sa sektor ng public health dito sa Pilipinas. for 29 years, 9 years in the hospital setup, and 20 years in the community setup. Vivian, I'm 23, and ano po, dito po ako sa South Star for mga more than 2 years na, mag 3 years na po sa January. How do you find writing prescription data in the current paper-based law? Well, to be honest, it's really very tedious. It's impractical, pointless, and it's irrelevant to the practice. Ano po, parang tedious siya ang daming ginagawa na. Siyempre, pag nagsusulat, kailangan nagmamadali. Tapos, ano, uh, more on dapat legible siya. Ano. How do you like the FDA electronic logbook mobile application? Oh, I like it very much. Uh, now I can say you are digitally in with this new innovation. Mas madali po, kasi isang picture mo lang, may copy ka na agad ng prescription, kahit i-save mo lang siya for later, mamaya mo na i-edit. Now that you have used the FDA electronic mobile app, would you like to go back to paper? Oh no, not anymore. Hindi <laughs> na po. Okay, there you have it. That's the last presenter for this session. Um, we'll now have the open forum at this point. I'd like to call on um, our three presenters, Dr. Ortiz, Dr. Marin Panganiban, and Ms. Phoebe Lazaga to join me here on stage. And Dr. Maloney has also kindly agreed to uh, join the open forum. And before we begin with our open forum, please join me in thanking them for their uh, very comprehensive, very insightful presentations. Let's give them, give them a big hand. So uh, just a few house rules before we begin. Um, please, uh, we'll take three questions, questions at a time. Please uh, uh, state your name and your um, affiliation. And please keep your questions or comments concise and direct to the point, please, so we can entertain uh, more, um, more people, okay? So who wants to start? Anyone? Looks like everyone was overwhelmed by... Um... <laughs> okay, please, sir. Good morning. Uh, I am Bienvenido Plus Jr. I am uh, from Minimal Government Thinkers and also a columnist in Business World. Uh, I like the presentation of Mr. Uh, Ortiz, no? especially the last presentation about uh, no matter what bureaucrats and politicians, they cannot really predict what, what is going to happen. My question is, um, because if you will notice, what a lot of innovation now is uh, away from regulation, regulation here, innovation here. It's like what's happening with Grab and Uber, no? Uh, LTFRB bureaucracy is conversant. That's why they invented things like that. So what's happening is that there is a laggard follower, uh, like you mentioned about China, and China being now a police state. Do you think that uh, us, uh, Big Brother, uh, uh, they will, of course, they will invite um, um, hatred from the citizens. Do you think that 
a more police state will will re, re, lead ultimately to the disintegration of bureaucratic countries like China. Thank you. So you are addressing your question to uh, Dr. Ortiz, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's why it's important, and this is a development already in Europe where they have the GDPRS, the Global Data Privacy, where we need to move from, we need to answer the question, who owns your data? Who owns your data? So right now, there's nobody that answer the question, so the custodians of your data, the gatherers of your data, including the government, and uh, we've had already two, two incidents, one with Comelec and now the other one with DFA. Um, if the movement in Europe, which is probably what's gonna be emulated, is the idea of self-sovereign ID. So the owner of your data is you. You're the owner of your data, and you're the one that gives access to your data, and you give access only what is required by whoever needs access in order to process the transaction, right? I mean, it's like the idea when you go to a bar and they ask for your ID, and all they need to know is whether you're 21 years old or not. But then they ask for your driver's license, which has your name, your address, your blood type, all other information that's not required for the purposes that they, know they need, right? So the end goal is a self-sovereign ID, where the owner of the ID is the, of the data that's being collected is you. So you know what data was collected, where it's fake or real, which we don't know in a black box AI scenario or IoT scenario. You give access to the data and you limit the access to the data and who you give access to the data. So this is already happening in the EU and I think over time it will happen in the rest of the world. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Second question, please, Dr. Pake, I saw your hand. And then to be followed by uh, Dr. Ruel Briones. Uh, this is addressed to everybody, except that maybe I would like to um, Marianne Panganiban to okay. start with this question. Um, essentially, my question is this. Um, What uh, are the most important uh, barriers as well as lessons that we can learn from the experience of uh, uh, Uber, the demise of Uber in a highly regulated field of the uh, transportation uh, business? Uh, and. Is this something that is typical to other regulated industries? Okay. And, and what, what can we do about this uh, to facilitate the entry of innovative uh, firms? Thank you very much, Dr. Pakeo. Any question related to that, which uh, you may want to uh, say now? No? OK. Ruel? Before uh, we let uh, Marian answer that question. So good morning, and let me shake things up a bit. In finance, pharmaceuticals, and transport, what are the biggest, what is the top problem you've encountered so far with your regulator, and what do you think they need to do to shape up? Mm -hmm. Okay, Marian first, and then perhaps all four of you can give your um, insights on the third question. Yeah. I think Dr. Ortiz touched on yeah, very important um, insight here um, to answer both questions, which is the importance of yeah, a mindset that is open to innovation. I think before we start discussing clauses, provisions, and specific regulations, there has to be that willingness to understand first how the business operates, that, there, that the rules right now, the existing regulations right now, may no longer be applicable. 
As I've mentioned a while ago, as a regulator, there's a tendency to hark back to the past and to use that for your decisions for the future, when in fact, they may no longer apply. And the innovation mindset, this is not just in terms of like the products you build or what services you provide. It's also actually in the policies that you create. And it's important to have that willingness and also that humility. So Dr. Maloney mentioned this a while ago, that firms don't know what they don't know. And also government officials, as I've mentioned, also don't know what they don't know. And you have to learn from each other. And I think that's the lesson also from Uber's exit in Southeast Asia. There are there are ways to which we can go about it, and that could be more constructive and productive. And that starts also from the willingness, from that mindset, and that openness to listen to different uh, parties at the table. And that applies to the conversations that you have, to the actual products that you build. And interoperability, not just in terms of the formats of your data, but also in terms of, yeah, the, the rules or the, the principles that you apply in your engagement with, with different stakeholders. Any insights regarding those? No, I just want to go back to that. You know, I think the govern the regulators need to focus on the value proposition to the Filipino people. And when we're facing the gov the, the the regulator. The viewpoint is either A, a system of control, or I don't understand. And it's a conversation between you, the, re the regulatee, and the regulator. When the conversation needs to be about what's the value proposition, the pain points that you're solving, how are you making society better, how are you growing? So. Normally, you don't get into that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Even in the bank, as the chairman, I've learned belatedly not to open my ma mouth when an idea is presented. Because the minute I make an opinion, it becomes the rule, right? And that's the same way with the regulator. So I have a 24 by 3 rule. I close my mouth for 24 seconds, and if I can do so, then I say, OK, I'm going to extend this to 24 minutes, and finally, in 24 hours. And during that 24 hours, I reflect not on what, ro what can be wrong about the idea, but what can be right about the idea. Because all our immediate reaction is always, what can go wrong? And then that's how we react. Oh, no, that cannot be, or this is going to happen, or how do we protect ourselves, or, you know, it's a risk management framework. And so I think it's important to see beyond the regulator's sort of ego, the regulator's ego, and focus on the customer. Yeah, so I just want to share to you a term coined uh, from last year's the, uh, World Economic Forum. It's called AI. So it's not artificial intelligence, but augmented intelligence. Meaning to say, uh, this intelligence will come from the people, the stakeholders, and not only from tech's uh, perspective. Now, at the end of the day, because, you know, regulators, uh, private sector, stakeholder, uh, consumers, there seems to be an invisible wall between all of us, between us. And you know, at the end of the day, we are all humans, you know, trying to solve a particular problem that needs solving right now. Not 10 years, 20 years, okay? Now, if we have that kind of mindset as what uh, my uh, fellow uh, speaker, Dr. Pangilina, uh, Pang uh, Dr. Marian uh, mentioned earlier that, you know, if we just try to have this mindset that, you know, okay, we will try to solve this thing. So first, if we have that mindset, then we can actually step uh, to the next uh, level of conversation. And that's how, we be, how do we solve this kind of uh, problem, right? And th from there on, we can build trust 
also to each other, as what Dr. Ortiz uh, mentioned earlier. So uh, the takeaway is really, uh, you know, just collaboration, open conversation among stakeholders. And at the end of the day, if you get harmonized, then uh, as a, be a better solution will be in place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> just a, a quick point. Exactly the reason you're mentioning, you actually don't want that much discretion in your regulatory structure so that a bureaucrat has to be worried, am I going to get Am I going to get punished for making this decision when all the taxis go out of business and Uber's running the show and then they're going to point to me and send me to jail? I mean, that's why you want to have a more minimal discretion-free system. Um, the, you know, Uber in the United States has without question been incredibly disruptive. It's also raised the quality of taxi service immensely and it's dramatically facilitated public uh, transport, if you will. If the taxis had been able to lobby, da -da 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 -da, it just never would have happened. Um, so, clean platform, you know, and uh, yeah, less discretion possible. Thank you. Um, we now go to the second set of questions. I saw on uh, our um, Director General from the IPO field raising her hand, please, ma'am. To be followed by Dr. Pasqual, and can I get a hand <coughs> here? Yes, as uh, Abad Santos. Yeah, my name is Josephine Santiago, and I'm the Director General of the Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines. Um, before I go to my uh, real question, I just would like to make a short testimonial about the Grab services. Um, uh, I think like last month, I was on my way to the airport, and uh, midway from Quezon City to the airport, I realized that I left my iPad. Um, it was in, uh, I was uh, in Mega Mall, so that's ha um, halfway to the airport. And I started to panic. Uh, my my notes were there, and uh, I had to call my son. I said, "Can you come over to the airport?" Uh, I, I had there was shortness of time, and, and he said, "He this was the first time I heard about Grab Bike, Grab Express." And he said, "Why don't he's a millennial actually?" So I didn't know about that. So uh, he said, "Oh, we can. I, I can just um, book one and bring your, let him bring your iPad to yeah. the airport." I said, "What? That is uh, an, a government issued uh, device, and uh, I might pay for it. Uh, uh, and how much is it going to cost? Um, Three hundred plus." Uh, at the end, I had no choice. I said, "Okay, um, all right." Uh, get it, and uh, I would like to congratulate you. I got my iPad, all in one piece, um, and uh, I didn't. I, I I realized that it was a reliable, trustworthy system that you have. So I'm plugging it. Okay. All right. <laughs> Never before, you know, would we have that kind of service. Now, uh, to my question, uh, which is addressed to, of course, uh, Dr. Maloney here. Um, you mentioned quite a number of times about patents, and I'm very um, thankful for that. Um, I, uh, you mentioned something like uh, no one understands intellectual property more than you know the, the rest of the community or public uh, would not understand IP. I would attest to that. That's why you are trying to develop programs really for um, increasing awareness. Now, we also have the Ease of Doing Business uh, Act, where uh, we need to um, be able to uh, <coughs> dispose of our <coughs> transactions within a certain number of days, because the EODB law does not distinguish but uh, for those who understand intellectual property, particularly patents, would, not, would know that um, the examination, the filing up to the grant of patent would require, hold on, like uh, 
three to four years. Okay. That is an international standard. And um, uh, we are trying our best to be able to come up with uh, ca coming within the law, but at the same time without giving up the quality of patent examination that we should do. And in the Philippines, we have very low uh, uh, resident filers. My Philippines also in terms of the ASEAN ranking, we're six, number six in the GII vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the other ASEAN neighbors. Now, you mentioned also about technological dependence and the R&D in the Philippines, which is below 1%. Now, I wonder whether is it late, too late in the day for the Philippines to join the technological race? Um, should we be rather, uh, should we rather be, just be consumers and buying uh, uh, the technologies or maybe partnering? But yeah, I, I understand the, the uh, startup setups, but so um, we have been, uh, for the longest time, the 1%, below 1% had been there. It has never risen beyond 1%. So I think it's not the priority of the government in any administration. So would you, would you how, what would your advice be to us? Thank you. Okay. Before um, we allow, uh, we let Dr. Maloney answer that, can we have the, the next two questions, please? Dr. Pascual, please, your, your question. It's not really a uh, direct question. I was just uh, looking at the proposed creation of an expanded national innovation system in the Philippines with uh, the university as an important uh, element. But given my experience with the public university, I wonder you know, whether we are set up to do it, particularly we are to join the technological race that was referred to earlier. I think in the discussion, <clears throat> some attention should be given to our procurement rules. Procurement really takes a long time, and the rules are very restrictive. It's always awarding to the lowest bidder, whereas when we benchmark against Singapore, for example, the laboratories in the universities have the leeway to choose a higher bid, provided it can be justified. And uh, procurement of uh, an instrument, for example, from a single source is uh, subjected to competitive bidding where the bidders are agents. Uh, there are such, you know, there are many rules that have to be uh, looked into. <clears throat> The other constraint is the audit rule, the audit regulation. Uh, it seems that uh, our audit regulation does not have a tolerance for failure. Yeah. Uh, if, for example, a research proposal has been submitted and, and the end of the research work is completed, then the auditors come and they check all the commitments the details of the commitments made in the research proposal. If, for, for example, the research was a failure and there was no publication that came out, the auditor will still look for the publication. Uh, these are issues that have to be addressed if universities, particularly public universities, can be uh, more effective. There already, there's already a lot of uh, R&D work going on, but takes a long time to get things done, and it minimizes the effectiveness, you know, of the, uh, of the out output because of uh, delays in uh, putting together the experiment. Uh, trust is key, as uh, Dr. Tito Ortiz has uh, emphasized. I think all our regulations are based on a presumption that everybody in government is a crook, and that has to change. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pascual, for those remarks. Um, yes, can we have um, 
Asik Aloy of uh, the National Economic and Development Authority. Good morning. I'd like to reiterate the question of Dr. Ruel. Yes. Again, um, uh, we have th we have three regulators. Um, I, um, so I'd like to reiterate that if you can also um, give some thoughts in terms of the question of Ruel, in terms of what is the most important issue that you have with your regulators. And they'll be here this afternoon to discuss. Second is that even if you address um, the regulators, some of the solutions needed are across regulators. So then, um, what can government do beyond, let's say, um, looking at the quality and competence um, of, of the regulators, since, since you, you, you might need um, something just beyond addressing the issue at the regulator level? Thank you, Kaloy, and thank you for reminding us that. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ruel, <laughs> I, uh, I missed that. Okay, so first question is uh, f for Dr. Maloney, and it's, uh, it was artic articulated by uh, um, our DG of the uh, Intellectual Property of the Philippines. Is it late for the Philippines to uh, join the technological race? So what are the process prospects for uh, technology uh, production? Should we be just copying or adopting um, innovations from other countries? You don't have a choice. Um, the 20th century is full of countries that were asked that question 50 years ago, 25 years ago. Is it too late for us? And some of them get their act together and you know really, um, really catch up um, really quickly. Um, so. No, it's not. It's not. It's not too late at all. But there's homework to do um, to make that happen. The one thing you you phrase is, or should we partner with other people? You, you know, should we just buy technology from broader partner with other people? And I want to say that partnering with other people is not an alternative. I mean, in terms of technology transfer, there are very different modalities of it. And one of the best ways, I think, is exactly this partnership. And one case that comes to mind for me is, uh, is Norway, right? They discovered petroleum, whatever, in the North Sea 20, 35 years ago. And they could have just had Exxon come in or BP come in and extract it, but instead they negotiated a deal where they would work together and Norway would steadily increase its capability to analyze, to design platforms and all these sorts of things um, as part of a learning process and they built that in. Um, and so that's a, I think that's a very good way to do it, and, and linking into value chains, if leveraged well, can do that, right? But again, if I compare, if I compare the experience of Mexico and Korea with electronics, for instance, right? They both started assembling electronics in around 1981. Um, you just look at patenting in Korea versus patenting in Mexico; it's like a hundred times more in Korea. In both cases, you're doing the same thing initially. But it's kind of a commitment on the part of, and I, I'm in the World Bank, I'm just going to be hard to say, commitment on the part of government to say, this has to be a learning experience. This has to be a way in which we learn how to be a global level company and we learn where the frontier technologies are and leverage this experience. And so in, in, both, in both the natural resource case in Norway and in the electronics case in, in Mexico and Korea, it's kind of how you leverage these opportunities you have to to learn as a country. Um, so no, no, it's not too late. If I can take the patent question just for a second. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so, the, first, so the first thing I, I'd say is there's, mm, mm, don't get too hung up on that. Um, patents are an important way of protecting intellectual property. And I was, I was visiting something called uh, Silicon Valley Hanoi. And they had these really, really smart kids coming up with all these great ideas. And they had matched them with international financiers because you didn't have a good venture capital industry in Hanoi, so you got it outside. The problem is they had to file for patents with the government. And curiously, every time they filed for a patent, their idea miraculously appeared somewhere else. Okay, So I mean, this system has to be extremely well done, and there's clearly a role for it. So it's important. But a lot of other innovation happens outside of out of patents. And if you look at the United States, I've been doing some work looking at county growth in the United States. And you know, a l patents contribute a good chunk, but a lot comes through forms that aren't patenting. So uh, you want to have a good, clean patenting system that covers what it needs to cover. Um, 
but like for instance, sub massively subsidizing patents to get that number up, you know, you don't want to do that. Thank you, Dr. Maloney. And then now, may I have, uh, may I ask our um, three presenters to um, answer uh, the question of Dr. Briones, which was <coughs> again um, asked by um, um, Dr. Kaloy on what is the most important issue in your sector that you think our regulators need to address? Yeah, okay, so in our regulator is actually quite good, right? So I mentioned that we need adaptive regulation, right? And soft regulation, SRO, code of conduct, guidelines, they do that. I gave you the example of the PPMI. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of innovation in fintechs in the payment space, mm -hmm. and the way it's managed is through an SRO. So that's BSP. Yeah. They're outcome-based regulation also. So that kind of answers the question of Dr. Pasquale about, oh, there's no tolerance for failure on the input side, right? And in the in the way of how to do things. It has to be like this, three biddings, lowest price, blah, 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 instead of what's the outcome do you want, mm -hmm. right, for the people, right? We also have that in this particular case, which is very complicated, payments, lots of innovation. Outcome, 20% digital, bank the unbank. That's the job you need to do. Um, the issue of sandbox, you know, we've got two or three things in the regulatory sandbox already, and in fact, in the next two weeks, one of them, which is a blockchain solution for rural banks, is supposed to get out of the sandbox. So they're already doing that, right? So uh, I talked about our convergent app and how many iterations we've done already, which the BSP has allowed not on a pre-approval, which can be very suffocating, but on a post-review approach. So I think all those suggestions that I made are actually suggestions made by, that's already being done by a important regulator, which is the BSP, so right? So it, it can be copied by others. So what you're saying is in the area of uh, banking and finance, we're doing okay. We're I think okay. so. Yeah? I yeah. think so, and we spend a lot of time. Now, I just wanted to comment on this patent thing that a lot of innovations, and I think this was mentioned, are not about hard science, right? It's about mini, it's about customer experience, right? So for, you know, like, Minimum hygiene, 24-7, Six Sigma reliability, real time, safe and secure. You know, all these data science things and how do you get, uh, I think you mentioned it, hypersensitive, hyper, you know, hyper, in the, well, we call it the customer segment of one, right? How do you produce a customer of segment one by using data to optimize to use uh, cognitive insighting or even contextual insighting to be able to give the customer a better experience. And that's a huge part of innovation. Okay. How about in transport? What is the foremost issue that our regulatory body should um, address? So I think the chance, like within the transport space, there, is, there are plenty of things to learn with how they're doing it in the finance, financial space, finance space. And yeah, focusing on the outcomes instead of the processes and inputs would be very helpful. And as, as mentioned, there are plenty of competent people in government mm -hmm. and well-meaning too. But as quoted by, uh, earlier about, uh, Eleanor Ostrom was quoted earlier, but no matter how well-meaning they can be, the people who will be in the best position to solve their problems are people on the ground. That's why minimal discretion is needed. Oh. There's a high likelihood that the rules being set up in one space, let's say the mobility space, might run against um, rules in the finance and the fintech space. And the more rules you have, the more, the higher the likelihood that those rules will clash. So that's why it's important to set up, you know, more gen general principles, and 
Yeah, I think where government can really help is to facilitate that kind of coordination between different agencies and ministries. And I think this has been a call, constant call, and yeah, I echo that once again. <laughs> Yes, so there are two ways that I can answer this. So uh, on M. Clinica's experience and on the healthcare uh, field uh, aspect. So for M. Clinica, just like Dr. Ortiz's uh, experience, uh, we are very fortunate that we are, uh, our regulator, the FDA, is really open to um, innovation. In fact, uh, EDSS is just a part of their innova innovation program. So they are now open to new changes to actually impact public health. Now, secondly, to just answer that you know uh, question about what important um, you know challenges that you know the healthcare sector uh, is facing right now in terms of you know getting this innovation together. Uh, from my point of view, uh, it is all about you know interoperability. It, not only for the uh, technological uh, angle, but for the people. So, healthcare is highly regulated field. There are a lot of of of, of legalities that that we need to work on. Now, healthcare. One of the things that uh, I'd like also to touch is that, you know, uh, these things will not happen if it will not if it will not uh, empower people, right? So. These people need to be empowered. You know, in healthcare, as we know, nurses, I'm a nurse, and uh, um, unfortunately, we are not really that, uh, you know, um, given, we, you know, let's say it's very unfortunate that, uh, you know, we, we lack access to, you know, uh, uh, certain uh, what you call this acceptable income, for example, right? That and in healthcare, it involves everyone. Now, for for us to be able to be empowered and to to promote that or to to contribute to that, you know, innovation, public health, it needs to come from the, these gra grassroots, you know, uh, com uh, community health nurses, community pharmacists, etc. For them to be empowered, they need to be educated. Right. So I'd like to share just one uh, quote, you know, uh, just story. I don't know if you've heard this, but uh, when former U.S. President uh, Kennedy went to uh, the Na NASA, and uh, he met this uh, janitor, and the, and this, uh, and he asked this janitor, "So, what are you doing here?" And then this janitor said, "Oh, I'm just helping these guys uh, fly men to the moon." So with that, even if whatever position that person is, he knows what he's doing. So whether what position you are in healthcare or in other field, uh, if you are empowered, you really want to, you know, contribute to the improvement of your field. So, uh, uh, so I, for me, in my point of view, it needs to come from that per, uh, from a, a grassroots level perspective to actually empower these people. So. And uh, what can governments do beyond um, looking at the competence or improving the competence of our regulators? I, I, that was the last question that we got from um, asked by uh, Dr. Abadzan. Would you like to comment on that? Mm -hmm. Competence. That was your question, right? What can we do beyond looking the uh, at the regulators? Perhaps um, we can answer that probably in the in the uh, next session, no? Okay. Mm -hmm. but, but I, I just want to reiterate so that point doesn't get missed. No, that I don't think there's a competence issue. I mean, there's a learning issue mm -hmm. because obviously these are new technologies and all of that. But they're intelligent people. Mm -hmm. I think it's again a re it's the it's who they view as their constituents. <laughs> So I'm regulating a bank. I'm regulating a taxi. I'm regulating a, a, a pharmacy or a clinic. That's the view. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you look at the 
the landscape, like, oh, the taxi companies beside the ride sharing and the taxi drivers as employees versus the, the grab drivers as entrepreneurs, yeah. you know, all these sort of issues need to be overcome by the regulators by going to the people, right? Because now it's easy crowdsourcing ideas, crowdsourcing feedback loops, you know, that's what technology has empowered. Go to the people. Are you happy with your existing situation? Yeah, it's heavily regulated, mm -hmm. so therefore it should be great. But it's not great. So we had this testimony that you just gave, right? I mean, that's something that the regulator should understand. And that was, I don't know, was that motorcycle or whatever? Because there's this big issue now with ANCAS yes. and yeah. all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So the question that needs to be asked is, what do the people want? want? How are they going to be benefited by it? Mm -hmm. And then my job now is, okay, they want that. How do I protect them mm -hmm. so that it's thing? How do I ensure a level playing field, et cetera, et cetera? Not how do I protect the, you know, the yeah. existing regulators or the existing franchisees, something like that. So you're saying let's focus on the four. I'm well, we need to include that conversation yes. mm -hmm. with who are you regulating, for whose benefit are you regulating? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll have. Um, you're going to say something related to that, or no, not related to that. The question on the university. Yeah, please. Please. Yeah. So, so, so quickly, can I? We can't hear. Hello. There we go. Um, so, so quickly, there was a, a question about how do we increase R and D and how do we increase patenting over time. And I just wanted to stress, make again, the point that I tried to stress, which is don't start there. Start with the demand from of firms to accumulate new knowledge. And they may have to spend on R&D to get that knowledge. That may involve patenting. But you, if you just sort of focus on getting up R&D and having more government programs to finance R&D and stuff like that, without focus on who's actually going to do that in the private sector, you're pushing on a string. And that's a waste of time. Now, once you get these firms who are capable of doing, of really being innovative, then they need partners, and universities are one potential partner. And this is a problem around the world that you have to often reorient the existing system to serve the private sector more. And that tends to be a question of in getting incentives right, um, such that it's worth the incentives within the university, financially in particular, are such that they. Uh, encourage people to find private sector partners and work with them. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll help the, um, well, Carla has just uh, flashed her uh, time is up um, <laughs> thing, but uh, I think we'll, we can have uh, one last round of questions, right? So Dr. Sikat, please, <coughs> and then we'll have another one, the lady here, and then we'll have one more from our online viewer. I'm not going to ask a question, but I'm going to make a, a, a little remark, which I think is very relevant to our discussion here. Uh, I am very impressed by the way the discussion has happened. And uh, if I were to give a congratulatory mode to all of them, I would, if I were president of the Philippines, appoint Justo Ortiz as the next DIC secretary. <laughs> he will probably be able to do a lot of, uh, <laughs> anyway. I might need to go to the because you Because of the things that you, because of the things you've said, you have the you have the adaptive capability to relate to all the problems that will happen but let me make one important remark we are at the envelope of the FIR revolution a little too too near the origin rather than too far out singapore is far out malaysia is far out 
uh, next to Singa be below Singapore. Korea is far, far out, I guess, because they have managed to develop a lot of things in relation to the challenges that were given them. You know, I've been in government for so long, and I'm, uh, uh, I mean, uh, for, for many years, and I have observed, I have been an observant of Philippine development. And if some of you remember, I'm not very good at praising our level of development. The reason being that even if I've been in government for so long trying to change rules and so on, I have been in my life hampered by a lot of constraints that have been and uh, that have been very difficult to change. And up to now, those constraints are happening in our country. Let me just go back. If we had followed, if, if we had understood the wisdom that uh, Justo Ortiz has been saying about adaptive regulation, we would not have created a constitution that made us uh, circumvented completely in relation to our opinion about what we need to do in improving Philippine development, which was to circumscri circumscribe many of the rules related to foreign direct investments in the country. And so, as we went along, uh, we ourselves hampered ourselves, uh, we, we hampered the way we would develop as a nation in creating the domestic capacity to adjust to all the rules related to the modernization that our present, uh, uh, that our experience required. So we got left behind even in domestic development because we could not adjust to the dynamic challenges that foreign direct investments brought to countries that opened the eyes of their development processes at the beginning. So remember, in 1935, those, circumvented, those rules about circumventing development uh, policies were there in the Constitution. And up to now, we have a government that is unable to even relate to those and push those as the forefront of the, of the constitutional revisions that we have to make. We are doing all kinds of suggestions on the periphery of what we most need, which is to free the economic level of decision making and create great opportunities for Filipinos to move forward. President Pascual made a few remarks about the problems of COA. To me, COA has been a great disservice in many respects because it is so hampered by all the regulations that are teaching it how to behave in a way that uh, has created a, uh, a system of uh, control and auditing which enables us to move only step by step when we could jump forward. Well, I, I have a lot more to say about these things, but uh, unfortunately, you know, I tend to perorate too much on the problems, but you can tell why I am so passionate about all these things. If we are to move forward in, in terms of FIR, perhaps if we can develop the kinds of regulations that moves the envelope forward, even those things that hampered us in the past will move forward in a way that is faster. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. Gerardo Sica, the founding father of PIDS, first director general of the National Economic and Development Authority and professor emeritus of the UP School of Economics. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming today. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Those were very, uh, very much appreciated. Now let us go to um, your question, ma'am. Um, hello, uh, I'm Lights. Um, I'm the National Project Coordinator of Women in STEM uh, for the International Labor Organization. 
Um, a lot of the work that I do is really on public-private partnerships. And for people who have w done this kind of work, it's really the challenge of getting government um, to work with the private sector in agreeing to improve either its regulations or doing projects. Um, and I like what you said that um, collaboration is actually the first step towards innovation. We've heard these words, but sometimes, you know, it, it, when you're down doing the work, it's so hard to get them to agree. And I like what Dr. Ortiz said that, you know, they're very lucky that they have a very good regulator because they also speak, um, private spe sector speak, right? I wonder from your um, experience in health and in, uh, especially in transport, maybe we, you can share us some, you know, like, tips on how to get government to agree to work with you uh, in the private sector, um, especially in these important things as re regulations. Because the first thing that they say, no way, you know? This is the way we do it. Um, and I think we have a lot of regulators around here or people involved in that who would love to hear about that. Thank you. Well, that's a very uh, interesting question and fair question. So from this uh, uh, conversation, now we've been talking about how you know, there's challenges of, in the regulator side. But how about we shift that thinking? How about what are the challenges that, you know, um, uh, what, are, what are the challenges that we need to actually address coming from the uh, private sector perspective? So, because in our case, uh, we actually uh, tried to, you know, uh, number one, put value proposition on our uh, case, and number two, educate uh, uh, our uh, government counterpart, and then three, gather the stakeholders. And when we met with this uh, regulate, regulator, regulators, um, fortunately, we are definitely lucky, just like Dr. Ortiz's um, situation, that they are able to grasp this kind of new information and new innovation <coughs> easily, immediately. But the question is that, if it's easy, for, it was easy for us to actually get the sweet yes coming from the government. How did M Clinica actually get that sweet yes, right? So it took us uh, years, actually four years to be exact, to to uh, uh, finally put this uh, or work together with the FDA in terms of you know uh, policy uh, draft. And uh, for us to be able to uh, get to that uh, you know point, it was all about you know uh, uh, first, of course, you were right, collaboration, and then also trust uh, from the from the government. But it was also hard work for the private sector to be able to actually inform or transfer our, our you know, value, that we can add value to this uh, present or current existing system that uh, the government is actually doing. So the statement here is that the private sector should actually double, uh, should need to have this um, double effort for us to get into the uh, public sector thoughts, so, yeah. Thank you, Phoebe. So, yeah. so just a quick note. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Grab's first principle is outserve your customers. And as I said a while ago, our customers, they're also voters. They're also yeah. constituents. So once, if we're able to present our case that we're actually serving the interests of your voters of your constituents, then it's much easier to have that conversation. And it's easier, and it's, for regulators, you, it's easy to, to turn like industries into, you know, nameless, faceless entities. But in fact, these are people who can complain, who can vote against you if you don't perform your job. And if we're able to align interests of both the public and private sector, then it's much easier to set up the regulations in such a way that 
yeah, you serve your end customer, your voter, your constituents. Can I, yes. can I just add something that I mentioned? Is we need to get also a little more comfortable with what I labeled as soft regulation. Mm -hmm. So it's not only hard, because the minute you hard code it mm -hmm. in a constitution or even in a law, oh my God, then it's an immovable thing, right? So it's very important. And so even a regulation, in our case, BSP circulars, it can get changed, but it takes a while also, monetary board, etc. So it's very important to get accustomed to soft regulation, which requires, that's why I mentioned the mindset change is important, because what's soft regulation? Issue guidelines, mm -hmm. right? Issue a code of conduct. Issue a, in our case, a framework, right? Mm -hmm. But don't prescribe the how to do it, right? It's got to be one way, because that's what innovation is about. It's the how to. The outcomes we can define. How do you get to those I outcomes? How do you get to 24-7, real time? Don't prescribe that, because that's constantly evolving. evolving, constantly moving. But you soft code it, rather. So I guess that idea, it's not only a law or a regulation. There should be something in between, right? SROs guidelines, code of conduct, etc., and then move from there. Thank you. Thank you, guys. For our last question, let me um, um, read um, a question from our uh, Facebook Live viewer. No? Uh, as, I've, as we've said, we are live streaming this event, and uh, the question came from Merwin Salazar of the Senate Economic and Planning Office. What specific legislative actions do the Philippine do do our speakers here recommend to that Congress should immediately address um, for the issue on the convergence of regulations in the country in the context of the impact of fire on both the private and public sectors? Probably quick answers, please, uh, ladies and uh, Dr. Ortiz. Would you, would you like to comment on that? I think if you pursue a legislative action, so that's in a way hard coding it, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that goes against the pre, I mean, I am also for soft coding things uh -huh, first, uh -huh. because that allows for quicker learning and this iterative process that we have in the private sector, you also, I think that's also important if you want innovation in the public sector. So yeah, I think uh, the legislative action is not, is not top of mind right now, if we are looking for inno innovation per se. Thank you very much. So I think go going um, through all the presentations, we can see a recurring theme or a recurring remark, which is we should be flexible. We should be adaptive, no? <coughs> collaborative. Um, what else? We should uh, be open to learning uh, from, each, from each other. And uh, we should um, really look into what this innovations how these innovations are contributing to, to society. I think that's one very important um, factor that we should consider whenever we assess um, regulations. Okay, so friends, once again, please join me in thanking our excellent panel of speakers for their insightful remarks and their very comprehensive presentations. Thank you, thank you very much. So at this point, it's now, it's time for us to nourish naman our body, no? After having that um, um, very uh, insightful presentation. So guys, we will have a one hour lunch break. We'll come back at, um, okay, 35 past one. So yeah, 1.35, please come back. Okay, the lunch